Hey everybody, welcome to Story Story Night's 10th anniversary flagship season, The Decades, and our adapted format, Story Story Webby Night. I'm Tom Michael. I'm the general manager of listener-supported Boise State Public Radio, a proud sponsor of Story Story Night. So please put your hands together because it is my pleasure to welcome to the screen the artistic director and host of tonight's show, Jody Eichelberger. Oh. What? Oh, it's me? Oh. Oh. Yeah, you. Oh, my God. Oh, dear. Um, well, hello, everybody. Uh, I guess I'm looking a little quarantine-y. Um, hi, welcome to Story Story Web Night here again in my, in my little makeshift quarantine studio. We are so excited to have you all with us. Uh, it's just like the regular show, you know, uh, the structure of the evening is the same. Three featured storytellers intermixed with a community story, story slam. Of course, how we accomplish this is a little bit different. Uh, there will be no need to hack our Zoom meeting here in order to share your story, however. Uh, Zoom bombing has very much been in the news. Uh, actually, my mother-in-law attended a Good Friday service and uh, suddenly there were some naked, naked people um, running across the screen. So it ended up not being a good Friday after all. Uh, she said, we don't need to see that. And then she named a bunch of specific body parts that they did not need to see. And we don't need to see that either. Um, so this is a family show. We call it PG-13. Uh, so avoid profanity, vulgarity, and nudity, please. Nudity. All right, you can see that this atmosphere is a little bit different than when we are all together in a room. So let's get to know our space a little bit. If you don't see any controls at the bottom of your screen, you might have to take your cursor and move around a little bit. And then what you should see is a little button that says chat. And you should also see a button that says raise hand. And wow, Buffy, you were right there. You raised your hand already. That's wonderful. Let's uh, try that now. Everybody's raising their hands. We'll test that out and make sure that you have found that because that is one of the ways that you can interact with the show uh, by raising your hand to let us know that you have a short story that you would like to share. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and lower all the hands now. Um, also, just so you know, if you chat with a question in that little chat room, uh, Carolyn, our board president, is monitoring those chats again so she can respond to you and answer some questions. Um, I am feeling, oh, there's um, some little, I am feeling a little isolated right now. So actually what I would like to do is um, see if there are any of our attendees who feel like you're a good laugher uh, maybe you're told that you're a good laugher and um, raise your hand if you think you're a good laugher. I won't share your video or um, it'll just be your audio. Uh, so just to have a couple of people in the room. All right, we've got some uh, people who have volunteered. Uh, so um, I'll just uh, allow a few of you to, all right. Uh, so if you raised your hand, go ahead and give us a little chuckle. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Uh, I'm gonna add, let me add one. No, that's a good group. Actually, let's get one more person in here. And what's kind of fun is you, all of you that raised your hand, you can't tell necessarily whether you've been selected or not. So you just have to keep laughing. All right, well, that feels better. But you know who is a really good laugher, actually, that I know is our friend, uh, Jessica Holmes. And, hi, Jessica. Hello. There <laughs> she is. <laughs> uh, Jessica, of course, is one of the co-founders of Story Story Night and a longtime uh, host as well for six years. And she's gonna be sharing a story with us a little bit later, but I thought I'd have you here with me during this part, just for fun, along with our laughers. Cue our laughers. <laughs> Excellent. You guys are great. It might be flashing your name if you're a particularly strong laugher, so that's sort of fun too. 
Uh, all right, so that's how it's going to work uh, when you're a slammer. Um, I will ask for a slammer and you, I'll see the names of potential slammers rise to the top. I'm just gonna lower these hands again. And then um, you'll have five minutes to share your story on the theme 20s, which we are loosely interpreting to mean today, or it could be things that happened in your 20s or that took 20 minutes to do. Um, I do need to thank our guest musician though. Let me see, where is her screen? Here she, whoops, she moved. Here she comes, spotlight video, unmute. There we go. Hi, Lita hey, Harris Newstetter. Thank you for playing for us tonight. Indeed. Happy birthday to us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, now, Lita has actually been at this spring show every year for the last three years. And normally, she um, premieres a music, a mini musical that's based on one of the slammers from the season. Uh, we decided not to do that right now. Uh, and wait until we can be together again in the same room. Uh, not Lita and I, we're doing fine. Just, you know, all of us together in the same room. Uh, yes. So we actually, that does bring to mind that, you know, during this time, a lot of weddings have been postponed. Uh, people's ceremonies have been put on hold. And apparently there actually has been a change in people's um, vows where uh, they're adding force majeure clauses. So yeah. that's gonna be interesting. Apparently it'll come in, you know, for better or worse uh, in sickness and in health, till death do us part or a stay at home <laughs> order lasts more than 90 days. <laughs> so that, we have to look forward to that when we do get going with weddings again. Yes, thank you for your laughter. That actually is quite helpful. <laughs> I actually did get an invitation on Facebook from someone named Janice. I don't know who this person is, uh, but she yeah, wants me to join her um, page, which is called Smart Divorce Idaho, $1,000 including attorney. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's a tool apparently that's out there and available. Uh, she has 173 likes on that page, so apparently it's building some steam. <laughs> I'm not sure why it was sent to me. She must know something that I don't know. Yeah. Well, in addition to the, uh, in addition to the... Are you ready for a noodle? Are you ready for a noodle? Oh, someone's ready for a noodle. Is that one of my laughers? <laughs> a laugher. You're doing more than laughing right now. Uh, I want a noodle. I don't know what that means. Uh, anyway, uh, another thing that's getting postponed is uh, graduations. <laughs> and actually, my niece who goes to Oregon State University doesn't look like we're going to have a graduation for that. Um, my nephew, who's at Boise High, graduation ceremony looks kind of unlikely, which, um, you know, I have dreams now about, uh, yeah. about not being able to find my uh, history class, or I can't remember my locker <laughs> combination. Uh, I wonder if these uh, high school students are going to have nightmares about, so many of them are having to finish classes on Zoom uh, online. I wonder if they're gonna have nightmares about like spotty Wi-Fi or not being able to, <laughs> or about, like buffering problems or something. Or, you know, the dream about showing up to class with no pants on. Oh wait, that's actually a reality. That's actually happening. You don't have to wear <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, pants. There's actually a, a lack of closure. Um, but uh, this reminds me of another person I have to thank tonight, which is our season sponsor and uh, Pettit Group Realty, uh, who is very good with closure. They close <laughs> deals all the time. And uh, they have kept with us through the season, even through the, even through this switch in platforms, which we really appreciate. Yes. You know, one of the things about uh, being in this platform is <laughs> that we're really borderless. So yes. we may have people attending right now uh, who are from beyond Boise, which is pretty cool. I actually had to look up our time zone to see uh, what time zone we were in. Uh, and I didn't realize there's a mountain daylight time. I just thought mountain standard time, but we're actually mountain daylight time. And uh, it doesn't seem like daylight savings is actually that useful right now uh, mm. because when, you know, it, 
the difference between 7 and 8 p.m. doesn't seem very consequential when you're having trouble remembering if it's Tuesday or Wednesday <laughs> or Thursday. It's like, yes. you know, what, what are we doing with an hour difference? I can't even figure out what day it is. Uh, and what day it is now, actually, I know because what's amazing is delivered to my doorstep this morning from Jump is all of this for our 10th birthday. Oh, yay. yay. <laughs> see you anymore. Wow. Oh, yeah. All right, so we got all these. We got all these, and we also got a cake. Can you bring the cake, please? I'll show you the cake as well. It's pretty exciting. Uh, we, of course, were supposed to be, we were supposed to be uh, on um, that jump. Uh, here comes the cake. I'll have to show this to you. Okay, balloons, go away. Thank you. This is really sweet. It says, thank you for a dynamic decade. And you can see. <laughs> it used to say, it very recently said, now it's a warped record now. Uh, these actually are what records look like these days because they've been stored in garages and the heat has gotten from them and they've warped. And so uh, we will have a little of that cake a little mm. later, but we'll have some icing. Mm. Um, I'm going to bring Jessica on now and we're going to um, mute our laughers. Thank you very much to all of our laughers who helped us through that cycle. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm going to bring Jessica on because um, she, uh, well, she almost wasn't here tonight. Uh, she almost, Jessica, right? You almost missed our 10th birthday party. I did. Have you been, you've been probably to every birthday party that Story Story Night has had, right? From the beginning, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, I wouldn't miss this one either, so. <laughs> well, we're so glad you're here. And so Jessica has had quite a dramatic experience. Oh, there's more icing. Quite a dramatic experience. So she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, what it took for her to be here tonight. Well, hello. So I'm going to take you back to another world. It was two months ago, early March of 2020. Um, I was hiking through this forest on the edge of Nairobi, Kenya called Karuru, and um, I see a group of teenagers coming down the trail, and the guy at the end starts, he looks at me and smiles wide and starts singing, banish the ghost of Corona, and I was like, touche, um, because A, I was the palest person I had seen in that country, and be definitely a specter of doom and death at that point. When I left on this ill-fated vacation, the coronavirus was sort of like this far away flu thing. And um, there, was, there was none in Idaho, there was none in the entire continent of Africa until that is the day after I landed. So fast forward two weeks, um, it's the night before the 20th, I'm packing up to go on this two-week vacation into the Masai Mara. It's this wilderness area. It's the eighth wonder of the world. It's a three-day trip. And um, my flight was leaving on the fourth day. So I felt okay about it, except that I was, had a 20-hour layover in Paris, which is really the whole reason why I bought this ticket, because it was like this free vacation I just inserted in there, a 20-hour layover to like wander Paris. But by that time, the entire world was falling apart every single minute, and um, even Parisians couldn't wander through Paris. So um, right then, the U.S. declared a level four travel advisory, which meant that all Americans overseas must return immediately or be prepared to shelter in place indefinitely. So that was when I realized I was on this razor's edge between coming home in a few days or living in Kenya in a room by myself for months during the end of the world as we know it. 
So I have never wanted to see my cat more in all of my life. Um, uh, and that was the moment when my dad called. So he calls on FaceTime from Boise, like he was kind of like Q and James Bond. Um, and he is already on the phone with Delta. And I think you can see when somebody really loves you, when they call Delta customer service during the middle of a global pandemic, that was love. But Delta had no flights. They couldn't change anything. So my dad taps away on his little board and he finds um, this Emirates flight. It was flying out through Dubai. It was just like the night before my other flight was going to leave. And I just thought it was like, okay, dad, here's my credit card info. He pressed enter and then he has to go to the bathroom. So I stare at his lazy boy recliner just in suspense. And he comes back and he was like, sorry, it didn't go through. So I was like, okay, okay. But then like 10 minutes later, the orbit ferry comes to my inbox and magically I have a confirmation on this flight. So Emirates is like the Porsche of airlines. I'm pretty excited. I have two tickets, I have four days. So I go on safari, as you do. And there's something about existential terror paired with the unknown living through that, that sort of like crystallizes everything in amber. You know, every time just slows down and every moment seems stuck in relief and you're just, and the Masai Mara was out of this world. I have no words. But even the drive into the Masai Mara was beautiful. There were um, giraffes and zebra and these Maasai herders who were wearing this beautiful, brilliant pink wraps and the night sky in Africa, two times brighter than Stanley, Idaho, just amazing. Um, and it, the, with the cicadas all around, it felt like the stars were singing to you. It was just so when I was on safari, my Delta flight through Paris was canceled. Um, the night that I returned, the prime minister of Kenya announced that they were closing the borders about 20 hours after my flight was supposed to leave. And then Emirates, the entire airlines was like, yeah, we're gonna do the same. We're gonna drop mic on the entire world, see ya. Um, so I had one ticket, I had one day. When I arrived to the Nairobi airport, it was like a refugee situation, but sort of like a Karen refugee situation. Like the lady in front of me, they made a small minor mistake on her son's check-in. So they kept asking her to step aside and she was like, I will not step aside. I need to make it on that plane. It was like, people were terrified. So I look back and tear at the guy behind me and he ends up giving me his spare mask, which, who does that? And when I tell social media this, thousands of strangers thank him. So it's like a stranger loving stranger thing. Uh, when I make it into Dubai, I look on the board and I see that my Seattle flight is canceled. But my dad's already there. He figured out flight tracker and he's like, no, that's the next flight. Here's your date. You're gonna make it. You can do this. And though in reality, I was like, flying across the North Pole on this first class experience, I felt in my head like I was that one scene with Indiana Jones where the walls are closing in and the boulder comes out and he just barely makes it through. So, um, so when I land in the US, I cry. And I'm not the only one who cried on that plane. And I cried again when I saw my dad, I was wearing my face mask. Um, but he drove, he was driving me back to my Art Deco dream pad. And uh, I hate to get all Dorothy of Oz, but there really is no place like home with cat or Toto or whatever you have to hold on to. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. It's going to take a lot to drive me away from you. There's nothing that a hundred men or more ever do. I'm blessed to raise down in Africa. Gonna take some time to do the things we never had. Hello again. I've decided that uh, I should clean up a little bit. Uh, so I'm getting started with a little bit of shaving cream. Um, what, one of the things I forgot to do uh, is one, our birthday activity that we're going to do together as Story Story Night 
is we will be visiting an animal at Zoo Boise, you know, just like they, you know, a 10 year old birthday party does. So we've launched a poll to find out from you which animal we would like to visit. Uh, and I see some of you have started to find where to vote. The three choices are an up close encounter with Percy, the North American porcupine, or you can also visit with Claudia and Pesto, the Saris cranes, Saris, Saris, the Saris cranes, or the third choice is to visit uh, Vinny the warthog. So we'll give you just a, a moment to. Um, fill that out. Maybe I can introduce the featured storytellers while that poll is happening. I'm not sure how this works, if you'll be able to, to see both at the same time or not. Uh, but I'm doing this in reverse order. Our last storyteller, featured storyteller tonight is going to be Joni Tetsura Schuler. There she is. And before that, we will be visiting with the Maketa Stead family. <laughs> there they are. Oh, don't you all look wonderful? Uh, but before that, we are going to have um, Nicole Lefevre, who is images coming here in a moment. Well, that's not Nicole Lefevre. Nicole, you've grown a beard. <laughs> Where did I lose Nicole? Uh, I've got too many things on my screen between the our animals visiting and here she comes. It's going to be very dramatic. Here it is. Boom. There she is. So we'll come back to her in just a second um, because first we are going to look at this poll here. I'll share the results and then we're going to let Zoo Boise know which one. So we're ending the poll and I'll share the results. It actually looks like we have a clear winner. Uh, the uh, porcupine and the saris cranes were pretty close together, but actually it looks like the winner is that we will be visiting with Vinny the warthog. So that's gonna come up a little later in the show. Uh, but first we have a little musical introduction from Lita that is for our first featured storyteller. And I have lost this, there she is. Uh, so after this little musical introduction, we will go to Nicole for her story. beautiful Lita. Thank you. So I'm here to tell you about when I was in my 20s and I was hired to look to work as a fire lookout on a, in a 20 by and live in a 20 by 20 foot building in um, uh, for three months on top of a 9,000 foot peak and that was all alone. Um, our training for this lookout work was a little bit ominous. We were taught to spot map and report fires. And then my boss, uh, Roy Inskeep, said something about how girls hold up better than men out there on top of a mountain all alone. And I thought, hold up better. What exactly did that mean? I mean, being alone sounded mighty good to me. Um, but what was there to hold up to? Um, you know, and what exactly is the opposite of holding up? Uh, what did that mean? Well, we look out trainees um, heard stories then about um, the rescue of a man on a lookout who said he was under attack in the middle of the night and a ranger coming up in the dark to um, find the guy in the bushes and the windows on all of his, um, on his lookout, all of them broken out from the inside. And I thought, ooh, holding up. All right, so that was not holding up, breaking all the windows on your lookout. Um, so on a day in early July, I was flown into an airstrip um, back in the wilderness. And 
a string of pack mules hauled me and all my boxes of food up to the top of a mountain and left me um, sitting outside a small wooden building. And then they vanished down the trail um, into the dust. There I was alone standing next to a gigantic snowbank in the dead center of the largest wilderness area in the lower 48 states, 12 miles like from the nearest person and about 20 miles from the nearest road. Um, but, you know, this building, it had a roof and it had um, a 360 degree view of um, wilderness through 1920s uh, glass plane paned windows. I had a woodshed with a saw and an ax and a mall. And I had um, uh, been told that there was a spring a quarter mile down the mountain that I could fill up my cubitainers when I ran out of water. Everything I needed was kind of like right there or it kind of needed to be in my boxes um, because no one was gonna come and feed me or bring me water or even save me if I fell off the um, catwalk, the thousand feet into the lake below me. Um, Definitely not at night and definitely not just for minor things. But I had a bed and food and all the time in the world. So really, what could go wrong? Um, hmm. It was really, really quiet, though. Like, really quiet. So silent. And the words hold up um, kind of kept coming back to me. The safest thing seemed to be just staying busy. I kind of set to unpacking. and that really didn't take very long. Um, the sun set then, and in the darkness, um, I stood on the green painted catwalk, and in that wind, I was just, I was peering out, and there was not a single human light of any kind anywhere. Um, no headlights, no um, porch lights, just nothing but blackness, and then the stars. And the stars were not just above me, but all the way around me and down to the horizon below. It was abstract, but somewhere out there, I knew there were other lookouts on other peaks like myself, but I couldn't see them. The silence was really deep and heavy and humbling. And standing on the catwalk, I felt really, really tiny. Um, it was so quiet. I could hear a branch break in the valley below me by the lake and when I went back inside and got in bed I could hear animals moving in the dark under my floorboards and my heart started beating so hard um, and so fast that I just pulled the covers over my head and slept till morning just to try and keep the silence and the noise out. Um, in the morning uh, dawn was fairly miraculous I would say it was like a miracle because it reminded me to remember that dawn always comes, like it always comes. And that meant that I could make it through another night or any night. Um, and that was a good feeling. But still, day after day up there, it was just me sitting there. I could talk on the forest radio, but really only in formal kind of forest service lingo and really only at check-in times. My job was to spot fires, but the mountains had fresh snow and really, no matter how hard I looked, I really wasn't gonna find fires just then. So I alphabetized my food and calculated how long it would last. And then I kind of panicked be, and began to make a plan for rationing it. Um, the silence kind of kept pressing at me um, and it felt almost kind of like hunger and I knew that eating out of boredom was just simply not an option. Um, I had what I had um, to eat. And unless I wanted to eat something like ground squirrels, you know, food just couldn't be the answer. Um, and, you know, still the silence kind of kept pressing. Um, I tried to put my finger on what it was about it. And there was this external silence that was really obvious, but also there was an internal silence. And that was amplified because there were no distractions, no TV, no radio. We didn't even have internet or um, cell phones then. And I, there was a handful of tapes that I was rationing because I really didn't want to get sick of them. Um, and, and 
And so I just had to contemplate, you know, what was the problem with this silence? What was I afraid of? I mean, it seriously wasn't about bears or wolverines or bats or snakes or coyotes or anything. Uh, it was questions. Questions kind of kept pressing at the inside of my head. And part of my mind wanted me to think about stuff that maybe I really didn't want to think about. I mean, I was supposed to be looking for fires, um, but at this point it was raining. And I remember this voice, kind of an insistent older sibling or a fatherly sort of voice. And it kept asking these things like, what do you want to do with your life? Why do your relationships suck? Are you gay? What does it mean to be gay? What does it mean to ask yourself something, what something means? And who really answers if you ask yourself what something means? And how can you even have a dialogue with just one person sitting there? Do all people have two voices in the sides of their heads? A question ask, asker and maybe a question answer or a question refusing to answer kind of person. I, I was actually studying the evolution of cognition at Berkeley. And so this me on a peak asking myself the meaning of asking myself questions was probably kind of a perfect storm, I would say. I thought about Roy's words and, um, and how some people hold up better than others out there alone, as he said. And I was a little bit worried that my mind might become that broken record player, that it might dwell in a bad place, um, asking over and over stuff that was just like maybe too hard or unpleasant to answer. You know, like, why was I always alone? Um, there was a whole world of beauty around me, though. And I had lived a huge life. Um, even at 20, I had traveled all over and had read a thousand books. And I had so much beauty to dwell on and think about. And I wondered, why would I be at risk of dwelling in a bad place? I became really, really determined, actually, at that point, to hold up. I mean, I knew I could. I could walk and stay busy. I even walked 30 miles in a day one time. Um, I chopped wood. I hauled water. And, you know, I knew I could look for fires. Um, and honestly, at first, when you're out there, you know, you're looking through these binoculars and, and everything looks like a smoke, uh, like a um, light patch of um, soil on a mountainside, or the way this uh, steam rises out of the trees after a rain when the sun hits it. Um, but finally, I remember the voice of Basin Butte Lookout on the forest radio. Um, he said, 7-4, this is Basin Butte, I've got a smoke. And I got out my binoculars, there I am on my binoculars, and sure enough, um, there was a straight up column of smoke. And that, you can tell, is so different from anything you've seen. It's so, you know, just unmistakable. Um, and so it was right there beside his lookout. And, um, helicopters came and the radio suddenly got really loud and fire season kind of, a, you'd say that officially began at that point. And at that point, there was a whole lot less silence. Um, and Basin Butte kept spotting fires. Days passed and and even I spotted fires on his lookout. Um, it was, you know, it was then that I kind of noticed that the fires were starting after he would check out with me or with 7-4, the dispatch, to say that he was going for a walk. His lookout was on a road, and so when um, he got a motorbike, I noticed that the uh, radius of the fires from his lookout was getting greater. And I thought, oh, am I imagining things, um, or is this just all a little bit too odd? Um, I was the head lookout, and so it was my job to say something, um, like maybe to say that the fire seemed a bit suspicious, um, to say that maybe he wasn't holding up very well and that maybe he was starting the fires himself. Um, I wrestled with the idea kind of a lot. You know, was I right? Was I wrong? I even hiked the 12 miles finally down um, the mountain to the canyon bottom. Uh, there was a mail plane that came in once a week 
uh, and I sent a note out to my boss, Roy. But you know, by then I was spotting a lot of fires myself all over the forest, like runaway campfires and lightning strikes. In fact, at night, um, lightning would fall sometimes and you know, you just see this tiny little red flame begin to glow on a mountainside in the darkness. Um, and still, it was so quiet out there, so silent. Um, sometimes I read books, um, sometimes even a book a day. Um, books kind of let me live in somebody else's world for a little time, a little while, and somebody else's mind um, in a world that was either real or imagined. But the thing about books was that they always ended. And where I lived, you know, it was, it was good. It was a good place to be. Um, there was absolutely no reason I should need to escape it. Um, eventually, I got a message back, actually, from, that law enforcement had given Basin Butte a lie detector test and that he'd passed. But they said the fires were definitely arson. Um, and I could have let my mind dwell on kind of what we all knew. Um, but instead, I decided to watch for fires. And I watched for fires. I realized really that there were things that my mind in isolation alone just couldn't solve. Um, and I just began to pay attention to things on the mountain around me, to, you know, tiny variations in the sunset and the sunrise, to stars and trees and birds and plants actually to the ants um, that would gather on my mountaintop after a lightning storm and when they screamed you could tell that it was like it wasn't a sound it was a smell and that was amazing um, I soaked in all the changes and everything and the microscopic and the huge um, these things became kind of like a home for my mind, a beautiful place that I could dwell. I held up. Um, I learned to cut my hair and get creative um, when I ran out of toilet paper. Um, I felt full and not hungry. Um, and I came back to work actually on Peaks in the Wild all alone year after year. Um, and today in the years of the virus or in the time of the virus, my spouse Carol and I are holding up, we grow vegetables and I dwell in kind of my strong memories and I enjoy the silence and I hope you do too. And I hope you're holding up and I send love. Take care. Be well. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Because a vision softly came creeping, left his seat while I was sleeping. And the vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. All right, go ahead. Hi, my name is Melissa and I am the assistant curator here at Boise. So I'm so ha happy that you guys are able to tune in and get to learn some information. And it kind of, or it sounded like you guys had all voted, voted to learn a little bit about Vinny, our common warthog that we have here. I'm gonna do my best to talk as loud as I can. As you guys can see, I am wearing a mask and gloves. And this is just because we are taking those extra precautions, uh, even with our animals here. So we all wear a mask and we also all wear gloves anytime that we're working around our animals here. So over here, you guys will see we have Vinny. Vinny is actually one of our newer animals that we have here at the zoo. Vinny, Vinny, Vinny. Actually, this is a cool thing to be able to see. You guys can see he's on his knees right here. This is a very common thing that warhogs will go through and do. And these guys are specialized in order to go through and do this. And the reason why they do this is it is because it puts them close down into the ground and allows them to root down into the ground. And what they do in the wild is they're looking for everything that's under the ground to go through and eat. So that's actually a really important thing out in the wild because these guys help to aerate the ground 
as they're going through searching for food. So that's one of the biggest questions we get here is whenever they, they see him out on his knees, they think that, they're, that, there's, that there is something wrong, but that's actually a total normal behavior for him. And you guys can kind of see over this way, he's just kind of continuing to root down into there. Here, baby, you want a treat? You want a treat? Yes. Good boy. So as I said, Vinny is pretty new here. He's been here for about a year now. Uh, he is going to be eight years old in June. So he was born June of 2012. And he came to us from back over in the East Coast. Uh, these guys are found all over in Africa. They kind of tend to be more in the middle to Southern parts of Africa. And these guys really love to be in areas where they can actually get into shade. Because as a pig, they do overheat really easily. So, they're kind of limited on exactly the environments that they can be over in Africa. So what they're going to do is find lots of places that allow them to have shades or it's going to get nice and cool. Uh, here at the Boise, because we do have hot summers, is we make sure these, these guys have plenty of shade. And then we also make sure that his barn stays nice and cool. And then he also gets what's called a wallow. So he gets basically like a big, huge mud bath. And they just like to get into it. They roll around, they get all nice and dirty. You know, that thing that we all love to see pigs get, get into. One of the misconceptions about pigs is that they're really gross and dirty, and pigs are actually one of the cleanest animals out there. Uh, his exhibit is actually really easy to go through and clean. He tends to always go in the same exact spots, and he's really good about making sure his bed area stays really nice and uh, fluffy and dry and everything else too. These guys are also super, super smart. Uh, so a lot of places will do a lot of husbandry training, so it's things or behaviors that we want them to do in order to make taking care of them a lot easier. So Vinny here is learning quite a few behaviors. A couple of them is shifting, so coming inside and locking down. And then he's also learning how to target. So it's where there's a ball at the end of a stick and he moves around and touches it with his nose. And the reason why that's helpful is that because that allows us to be able to move him around really easily. And when we're trying to introduce new behaviors, that's an easy one to transition into. Some of the other ones that we're going to be working on with him in the future include some injection training, so where he actually presses his body up against the fence and allows our vet to be able to give him his vaccines and everything and make it really quick and easy. Nothing seems scary, and then he's as happy as can be. Uh, these guys do get their name warthogs because of the warts that are on their face, and then they also have these really long tusks here in the, in the top, and they also have these shorter tusks at the bottom they're actually a little bit more sharper and can cause a little bit more on the damage. Mostly those spotted ones are used to help them to root. The upper ones are kind of more of a fun little fancy thing to show off with the females. And they also will use them a little bit to fight with males whenever a female is nearby. Uh, these guys are considered to be a solitary animal as far as the males. Females will live in groups and males will only enter the groups when it's at the breeding time and they are looking for a female. Uh, these guys do not go through and pair up, so males and females will just kind of go ahead and mix up. And then uh, they usually reach maturity for breeding about a year and a half, they, but they have found that males like to wait until they're about four, four years old to do so. Males usually will stay with their moms for about two years before they go off on their own, and then they're just on their own. Females will usually stay with their moms until they reach that maturity, so for about a year and a half. Then they'll kind of go ahead and leave and form another group with some younger of the other girls. And later in life, they'll actually will come back into their mom's group and live to, together with them. He's so cute. Hey, yes, did, he can is. you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Um, did you say how old uh, Vinny is? So in June, he'll be eight years old. Hakuna Matata. <laughs> now the zoo is actually yeah. closed right now, right? It is. And I was told that uh, that you're wearing a mask, not just for person to person, but because you're not entirely sure what humans can pass to animals. Exactly. There's a lot of things about animals that we still don't understand. We are still constantly learning everything about them. So if we think that, that we know all, um, all the stuff there is about, about animals, they're going to go ahead and throw us a curve and all that fun stuff. So just to make sure that we are protecting them, we, we go through it and do this. Is this the only warthog at the zoo? We, yes. Uh, Vinny is our only one. 
Um, as I said, males usually like to be on their own. So he actually is perfectly happy just being on his own. He's got lots of visitors that are usually are here to, to keep him occupied. Uh, he is one of the favorites among our visitors here. He is a really, really cool animal. Um, and he's really big too. So that, that helps as well. Has their, behavior, has their behavior of the animals changed uh, by not having the public there? A little bit, yeah. We have noticed that some of them, uh, so humans in a way kind of act as a form of enrichment with our animals here in zoos. Uh, if you don't know what enrichment is, it's kind of, it's a activity that we can go through to give the animals to, st to stimulate their mind. So it could be stuff that has to do with their food, it could be adding scents, it could be moving furniture around, changing up their environments. So humans in a way actually are a form of enrichment because you're something to look at and you're different. One person is never go going to be the same as, as another person. So we do have some animals here that have noticed that we don't have quite as few people here anymore. Um, you know, there are some animals that, you know, they really don't care one way or another, but more of the interactive animals do. Well, thank you so much for That's our perfect. birthday activity and to Vinny the Warthog. And if you would like to support Zoo Boise, you can do that on their uh, Idaho Gives campaign on the Idaho Gives page. They are currently have a campaign for education and they're about 80% of the way there. They're, I think it's a $25,000 goal. Is that right? 25,000? Yeah, although we uh, unfortunately have to stay closed a little longer than we thought. So uh, anything okay. and everything will help. All right, and I haven't quite finished shaving yet. Uh, but thank you, Zoo Boise. Yay! Thank, thank you, Vinny Warthog. That was awesome. All right, we um, some of you have been promoted to panelists. Don't panic. The reason that happened is because our room was full and we had people who couldn't get in, and uh, so we moved them into a different room so they can still watch the show, but we could let more people in as well. And you will see in the chat room, there is a link to the Idaho Gives campaign for Zoo Boise. That was fun. We actually also have a birthday present here from, I'll jump, I'll open it really fast here. I'll try to anyway. There's a card. Ooh. Um, it's, is, it's a dog playing a electric guitar. And it says, we love Story Story Night. Thank you for bringing it to Jump. You rock. Happy birthday, Jump team. Thank you so much. They're so sweet. Oh my gosh. And let's see if I can take this really quick. Um, a little weird is good and i have no idea if that is facing the right direction on your screen or not it might say a little uh depends on which way it is i suppose thank you jump one of our gifts from them all right we are going to move to our first ever family story with uh, the Maqueda Stead family. And Lita is going to lead us in with a little musical interlude. And then when you come back, you'll see the family. <laughs> Jody. Uh, so I'm James and I've been at home. I'm Elizabeth and I've been at home. I'm Snowden and I've been at home. I'm Elizabeth and I've been at home. We've made occasional trips to the grocery store and taken daily walks around the neighborhood. James and I both work remotely. The, the only difference perhaps is that our house is 275 square feet. So that's a, roughly one tenth the size of the average American house. Um, we've got four people, three hermit crabs, and we live in a space that's a little smaller than a school bus. We have one bathroom, no laundry room, no dishwasher. We've got a dorm fridge for all our food, and, um, and we call our house the shed. Um, we moved here about two and a half years ago, and in part for the challenge, you know, we, we were living in a much bigger house, and 
and feeling a little overwhelmed by the excesses of modern life. So we thought, you know, move, we'll move into this tiny space. It could be fun. Um, we'll save a little money. And there might be some lessons here for, for all of us, but also for the kids, most especially that they couldn't learn in the big house. Olson, what do you remember about the big house? I had my own room with a bunk bed for sleep. I filled my room with toys, and when it got too crowded to get to the bed, I just moved rooms. When all the rooms were like that, my mom and dad would clean them. Now, now I'm squished and let my friends come over. I have to share the room with my brother. Anything else, Olson, that you remember? Yes, the hot tub. I'll tell you what I like: tea and hot tubs. We still have tea. So, so the smallness of the shed is omnipresent, um, but we have a big yard and until recently we traveled frequently so we could really embrace um, our time at home together in such a small space. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the US, um, the US Department of Housing defines an overcrowded dwelling as fewer than 165 square feet per person. Um, in 2019, there were about 8 million Americans living in overcrowded dwellings. Which statistically includes us. But on an ordinary day, we don't feel overcrowded, which is in great part because of where we live. Because any park feels like our yard, and any cafe feels like our office, and any museum feels like our after-school hangout. Before virus time, we had date night and pizza night and frequent visits to the zoo. We've visited Vinny before. The kids went to school, we had routines that we could trust, and we've temporarily lost those this spring. So when I began to realize that we were gonna be locked down, I wondered for the first time if we'd made a mistake in moving to the shed. Uh, if someone got sick, how would we isolate them, for example? Right, two years ago, the guys got the flu and self-quarantined at the Red Lion Hotel so they wouldn't get the two of us sick. But that wouldn't be an option now. We also wondered how would we work? How would we get a moment alone? And how would we homeschool in a one-room schoolhouse that we also had to eat, sleep, and work in? We have very limited storage, so we also wondered where we would put all of the extra food and toilet paper. Fortunately, when we moved here, we spent $30 on an Amazon toilet seat today, so uh, toilet paper storage is not our primary concern at the moment. But, um, <clears throat> but I have often thought that you know, my generation has, has kind of been free of many of the catastrophes that have, um, that have impacted other generations. We haven't had a Great Depression. We've had no um, great world wars. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I'm beginning to think that, that this pandemic may tie our children to the bravery and uh, determination of their ancestors. We named the kids after their great, great grandmothers. One was a Texas frontier woman. The other moved across the ocean by herself at age 16. James has a grandmother who's almost 100 and calls herself a string saver. She saves little pieces of string to make big string balls and she saves tiny pieces of soap so she can melt them together and make big soap bars. We've always admired those qualities of of thrift and resourcefulness and being givers more than takers and saying we instead of me and we've tried to parent um, in such a way that would instill those qualities in our kids although that sometimes feels challenging being two generations removed from the great depression um, but in virus time we are home a lot and it matters greatly that everybody contributes and cooperates and so a lot of these lessons of grit and gratitude are feeling less theoretical and more real and so that seems like maybe a silver lining of this time. We definitely saw some of those qualities come up in our kids this Easter. Yeah, the Easter bunny is an important character in our house. Um, and we weren't sure if, you, if she would be deemed an essential worker. So uh, we were able to borrow about a dozen plastic eggs from a good friend. And I, of course, left them outside in the sun for three days. And then when I did bring them in, the kids sequestered them to their bedroom. They came out later in the afternoon and gave me the eggs and asked if I would, would hide them the next day in case the Easter Bunny couldn't come. So James and I took them upstairs to the sleeping loft and opened them that night after the kids had gone to bed. And what we found inside the eggs were tiny pieces of yarn 
and dried up dandelions, little cut out pieces of paper, and a few pennies. We laughed until we cried um, because it was just so poignant that they had build the eggs to prepare their own Easter hunt with, with what they had on hand. Um, before virus time, our kids lived in a world where they could count on so many things. They could count on hugs from friends and visits to parks and um, the Easter Bunny coming each year. How did you decide what to fill the eggs with? We filled the eggs with little things we didn't like anymore. I put one to my ne love my necklace, but I didn't. It was too small for me, but he knew others loved enough. And I also put one of my origami stars in it. Olson gave me the hint of an orange egg so that he could find the ne no, so that I could find the necklace, and I told him pink so he would find the star. It was an agreement. So we're all home together. Um, you know, we've been talking to friends and family frequently, and of course, we are all realizing our interdependence on other people in the community and around the world. And we're also realizing at home um, even more things that we can do without. Um, you know, things aren't the same as they used to be. Um, but, you know, like the Easter eggs, our lives will go on filled with, with different things, uh, maybe humbler things and different kinds of activities that we can do at home. So in January, we set a family goal to learn to play the ukulele, and uh, we started our lessons in mid-February. Uh, some of us had two. I think some also had three lessons before we went into lockdown, but our goal had been to learn the ukulele and then at the end of the year to play a concert for our friends, the Pettits, in Hawaii. But since we've got you all here tonight, we thought we'd perhaps play just a short song. It's, it's one we've... Uh, We've been learning here the last couple of weeks together, I guess. And you may choose to mute us now. That could be a wise decision. We'll just be a minute. So that was a verse, thank you for humoring us. That was a verse from uh, John Prine's In Spite of Ourselves. John Prine died on April 7th of this year from COVID-19. Thank you to the Maqueda Stead family. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so you, much. Thank you, Lita. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, we are going to move to a our first slammer of the night. So if you have a story that you would like to share, if you would just uh, hit that raise hand there so that we can see who might have a story that they would like to share as a slammer tonight. Um, we're waiting for some hands to rise. And while we're doing that, I will open another present. Um, jump. Let's see what's in this one. So exciting. And we did get some messages for the Maqueda Steads. So great, 
Hi, Maqueda family, we miss you. Christina's mom. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Delightful. Um, since we can't have audience applause, that's a good way to do it. Amazing. Okay, here comes this gift. Oh, and did you notice that I dressed up now? This actually was a gift to me from my first cousin once removed. Oh, tissue paper. Oh my gosh, it's perfect! It's perfect for right now! Oh my goodness. Oh, how did they know I needed that to cover up my horrible chair? Someone is cheering. I'm not even sure who I have unmuted right now. Is that you, Lita? Are you cheering? <laughs> All right, I do not see any hands raised for a slammer right now. We're gonna keep that open uh, for you. If you come up with a story about the 20s, could be a story about today. Uh, and I'm gonna do tell you a little bit about our sponsor here in a second. And um, let me also get her camera up and running. So the Pettit Group is a small, thoughtful, carefully curated group of Boise realtors who are passionate about serving our clients with integrity and professionalism and our community with deep philanthropic giving. We'd love to have you like our Facebook page. That'll probably pop up in our chats column here in a second. And the Pettit Group at Group One Sotheby's, that's the name of the Facebook page. On our Facebook page, you can book an introductory meeting, read Andrea's thoughts about the impact of the pandemic on local real estate, and check out our latest video about selling an investment property in Boise. And here with us is Andrea and her special little person. I still have to unmute you. Hi, there guys. You hey, Jody. Did you enjoy? Happy your birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Did you enjoy visiting Vinny the Warthog? Definitely. Yeah. And love to see the Stead Maqueda family and all the story slammers so far. They've been so good. That's what a fun awesome. night. Thank you so much, everybody. It's fantastic. Well, one, of the, one of the things that we have done all season is do a drawing for a local piece of art that you um, yeah. give to people when they move into their new homes, uh, yeah. a list of Boise artists who provide copies of their work that you get to give to them. And yeah. um, so why don't we, can we go ahead and do a drawing yeah, for that? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, and Zoe, my helper here, we have um, Beth and Brian Wallingford. Um, Beth and Brian, if you're out there, um, we're gonna send you an email with a link and you get to choose a piece of art and we'll deliver it to you. And we're so grateful, thank you. All um, right. Enjoy the rest of your night, everybody. Beth and Brian, congratulations. Yeah, fantastic. And, oh, and don't put it back. Thanks for being with us all these years. We'll Yay. get a we'll get an email address to you. Do you like my new hat? I love the hat. I think that was what was missing for tonight. I didn't and even know. It's perfect. I didn't even know. It's perfect. It's like it all it just all comes together. It goes with your outfit. It's amazing. Yeah, this yeah. is by the way a t-shirt. If so you can tell, but uh, there we go. I, I didn't know. I thought it was really oh, really fancy. Oh dear. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Uh, always Jody. good to see you. Thanks, everyone with the team at Story Story Night. You guys are amazing. And thanks to all the storytellers tonight. They've been phenomenal. Thanks, Andrea. All right. Have a good night, Bye. everybody. Okay. We have, I forgot to mention that the panelists, because some of you are over there, um, can also be slammers. And one of our favorites Patty O'Hara has volunteered with a story. Go ahead and hit that raise hand button anytime during the show you want now, and we'll just collect some more, uh, some more slammers for the rest of the show. I am gonna unmute Patty, and I've gotta also do her camera. There we go. Uh, that's video. And then we're gonna move over to Lita, who's gonna do an introductory piece, and hopefully I'll have Patty up on the screen by the time she finishes that. All right. I my heart is me back to East Atlanta. All of my heart is in the valley. There's something about these men. Then I didn't walk up the high you ran. Then I never Hi, 
Hi, happy birthday, Story Story. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, <laughs> this is a surprise to me too. I didn't know I was going to be doing this tonight, but how exciting. So I was 25 years old and I had just come over from a semester abroad and my parents announced, I don't think I had even gotten home from the airport more than 20 minutes, actually didn't announce, but they said, so how would you like to go to Washington? DC. And I said, well, all right, I, can I unpack? Well, you uh, have an opportunity to go work in the Capitol, um, but you need to go now. And uh, my parents are, they were ones to live vicariously. So the answer was yes, of course I would, because I knew they would enjoy that I would go to DC and work. So, um, yes, absolutely. I think we took my suitcase and just put it in the back seat of the car and we took off for Washington, D.C. from Wisconsin, a little trek. It was a uh, it was a patronage position for a senator in Wisconsin. I don't think I'll name him because uh, part of this describes him a little bit. But anyway, this was 1975. Uh, Washington, D.C. Wow, I was so excited. I uh, went out there, I had nowhere to live. Um, we arrived and thought it would be a good idea for me to find a place to live because I would be starting work the following, I think in a week. And so we started walking around the hill looking for a place for me to live. I happened to run into a young woman who was with another person looking for a place to live. She had just gotten a job with her senator and we said, hey, let's find a room together. So we did. We found a flat behind uh, the uh, Library of Congress, right up on the hill, about two blocks from the Capitol, serendipitous. But we couldn't move into our apartment until uh, another week. So she said, well, why don't you stay with me? I'm staying with uh, my senator at his house. Well, great. I said, sure, I will. And uh, so I crashed on Senator Harrison Schmidt, Jack Schmidt, the astronaut's couch for a few nights until our, our apartment was ready. So Lucy and I uh, started our, our patronage positions, she for New Mexico and me for Wisconsin. Um, and one of the first things you have to do when you start one of these is meet with the senator who's sponsoring you. But before that, I got to work a little bit and get some orientation. I worked in the Senate document room. And at the time, in 1975, the document room was actually right across the hall from the Senate chambers. Uh, so it was this wonderful experience of going into the Capitol, up the elevator, and literally bumping into senators on their way to the, the Senate floor. You weren't supposed to, but you did. Um, it, was, it was real exciting. And then to work in that document room right across the hall, there was an old room where Charles Webster would read. They said there were all kinds of these old rooms and you could stand above the Capitol dome and hear the tours being given. And you could make little knocky noises and uh, let tourists think that there were actually ghosts living in the Capitol. So if you heard ghosts when you were in the Capitol, that was probably me knocking. We would uh, pull bills for the Senate floor. They would need something at the last minute or to reference and they come to the document room and we would find those bills for them. Soon into my time there, I had to meet with the Senator and I will never forget, it was, a, it was not a pleasant experience. Um, this Senator was well known for starting something called the Golden Fleece Award. He would find, uh, people or, or funding agencies or government organizations that were abusing funds. That was a good thing. So he really kept his eye on making sure funds were being used well. But uh, we, didn't, we didn't get off to a very good start. I remember meeting with him. First of all, I don't think he wanted to meet with me. I was filling in a position at the last minute. Someone else had dropped out, so I wasn't his first choice. I don't know if it was because I was a young woman or what, and was I in school? Well, I was between degrees. So I said, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be doing some independent studies. So, okay, so check, you're, you're doing independent study. 
I just remember feeling very intimidated. And this senator had just gotten a hair transplant. So he had these rows of plugs in his head. And they were, they were, they were still fresh. So they were, uh, it was, they were little, um, they were little pegs, bloody pegs, rows of pegs. And I was riveted. I couldn't take my eyes off it. Probably a good thing because it wasn't a good time with, I didn't, I don't remember any of the conversation. I was just very intimidated by this, this person. And it also turned out that my uh, graduate advisor was just uh, sent to jail for fraud and abusing federal funds. I didn't have anything to do with it, but so I, I didn't get off to a good start with this Senator, but anyway, I, I had a wonderful, wonderful experience in the Senate document room. Fortunately, I didn't have to spend a lot of time in that office. I got to work in the document room, peanuts all over the place because uh, Jimmy Carter was the president at the time. So we had unlimited peanuts. One of the last things I got to do was meet uh, one night, there was a filibuster and in through the Senate document room came uh, shuffling this uh, older gentleman from Wisconsin his name was Senator Gaylord Nelson, and he was the one who started Earth Day. He had started it four years before. And he stopped and greeted us, talked to us, thanked us for being there so late at night during this filibuster. And he shuffled off in his stocking feet to the Senate floor, to whatever the filibuster was at the time. It was a soft one. Democrats had House, Senate, and, and presidents. But, um, so ended on a good note. That was one of my final meetings in that experience. So that was my year of being 25. I know my parents enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. All right. We actually have something a little special. Bye. <laughs> we have something a little special now for our this is the point where we have like our feature song, which is going to be from Lita. However, she prepared it for us in advance. And it is her and her and her and her. So I'm gonna share this performance with you uh, as soon as I find, there we go, of I Believe in Me. I never thought that I was good enough Sometimes I almost felt like giving up It took a while to realize how beautiful I am inside But now I see the strength in me And I believe in me I believe in me Seems like I was always second best Somehow I was different from the rest I never felt like I fit in but Now I found my home within Cause Now I see strength in me And I believe in me Sometimes I want to give up and let life pass me by Especially when I feel so far behind Sometimes it feels impossible to turn myself around But I know the light inside me needs to shine and I believe in me I believe in me
Sometimes I want to give up and let life pass me by. Especially when I feel so far behind. Sometimes it feels impossible to turn myself around. But I Okay, I have to um, bring Lita in here a second. Uh, Lita, how did you do that? How did I do the video? Yes. Well, I decided, so the whole song is about me, right, and believing in myself. And so I felt like it'd be cool to go to my favorite places around the city, around the valley, the places I feel like most myself and record the different parts there. And um, so I'd go to like my favorite trees that are in bloom at the park. And when I was there, I kind of felt like, okay, this is where I want to do the percussion track. So like, what would I feel like if I was a drum? And then I do the drum and then up in the foothills where the sun was setting and it was kind of getting dark. And that seemed like a good place to, to pretend I was the bass. So I did the boom. Amazing. So yeah, I just kind of was like, what different instruments would I want and what places around town kind of bring out that vibe? Well, that was great. And I don't think you can see the comments, but we've got some pouring in that just say, Lita, wow, way to go, Lita. Oh, Should I say Lita's exclamation point, exclamation point. And awesome, what a beautiful song and lovely production. Thanks, lovely, incredible. Yay! Yay! All right. Well, we are going to move to our last featured storyteller, and um, that is going to be Joni Tetsuro Schuler, uh, which you will see on your screen right after Lita gives us a little bit of an intro. Before you came into my life, everything was black and white. Now all I see is color, like a rainbow in the sky. So tell me your love will never fade. But my clouds are gray. I don't wanna bring color to my life, Wonderful. Everyone, it's a warm spring afternoon last May. I am in the small agrarian town of Wilder, Idaho, known for its prodigious hops farms and, well, not much else. I've been anxiously preparing for this day for months, and now the fateful day has finally arrived. I'm sitting in the car and I am nervous as hell. The faint smell of manure hangs in the air. I am there for work, conducting surveys for a research study on human animal environmental health through the University of Denver's Institute for Human Animal Connection. Wilder happened to be selected as one of four communities in the whole country for this intervention study, and I get to serve as the local research assistant collecting data in people's homes. I'm about to conduct my first door-to-door -door survey for the year. And the fall, fall prior, last, that last fall, um, had been a significantly less anxiety-provoking experience. But this time around, I am endlessly ruminating in my head, am I safe? Will they find out? Will I be accepted doing this here in rural Idaho, being who I am? You see, I'd moved recently to the city of trees from the town of Stumps, Portland, that is Stump Town. I was there for a brief year and a half, uh, living on an educational farm in the southeast and doing environmental education through AmeriCorps. It was a very formative time in my identity formation in my mid-20s, uh, as is the case for most young adults at that age. You know, dance parties, vegan restaurants, social justice activism, hiking in the Columbia River Gorge, you know, the list goes on. Um, after my partner and I made the decision to move here to Boise for his job, I was ecstatic, but also pretty ambivalent. Um, ecstatic to live in the city where my dad grew up, where my grandma lived, um, the refuge where I, you know, grew up escaping every summer. 
And yet I was also equally ambivalent to kind of leave the weirdo loving haven, the place that had really shaped me, that was Portland. Um, given who I inherently am, I am uh, biracial, queer, vegan, Buddhist, essentially a tree hugging hippie. I struggled to adapt uh, to a new state of white cis heteronormativity. The vulnerabilities, the doubts, the visceral fears that I was experiencing were constantly front of mind as I navigated acclimating to this new societal milieu. Um, that was very different from where I had come. Um, I also grew up in larger cities my whole life. I was born in DC and lived in Tokyo and New York. And so to be in a much smaller place that was substantially different in many ways from where I'd grown up was a shock. But at the same time, there was also something really beautiful to that. It presented an opportunity, a glaring opportunity to experiment, to question, to you know, start anew in a way that I never had really an opportunity to do. Later that year, I am backstage at the Balcony Club downtown doing a half decent and also pretty bad job of applying makeup for the very first time uh, for my daring, delightful drag debut. Drag. My partner, a seasoned performer whose alter ego Gaia Indica focuses on ecological themes, um, is performing a number that night based on bumblebees. And he wanted to do a song uh, called Color by MNEK, and I was asked to be his flower, his floral backup dancer. Um, and actually the song that Lita just played was that same song. It's a really wonderful song. And I was initially reticent to take on the opportunity, as exciting as it sounded. Um, at that time, drag really was still pretty ostentatious. It was a little bit too ostentatious, a little bit too superficial, a splash too risque uh, for my liking. And yet here I was, stepping into this very new world of gender queer, gender bending expression that was ultimately surprisingly, incredibly and exhilaratingly fantastic. Uh, though the onstage experience was pretty messy and a tad embarrassing, I could barely look forward, I was so nervous. The offstage experience of effeminately altering my facial and bodily appearance in what was a very safe and affirming space and as a resplendent flower, no less sparked an ember in the depths of, at that time, my non-binary soul, that something in me wanted to do more of this, um, profoundly so. Jump several weeks later, this is in November, I'm on a short vacation to visit my friend B, um, enjoying some splendid time catching up and exploring her new city home. Um, as fashion, uh, avid fashionistas, uh, we had bonded over our shared love of style and of fashion and had dedicated a good portion of my visit to some shopping. So one afternoon we went to a flea market and we came across this little boho chic stall um, as a young woman selling some of her old clothes um, and it just there was an array of really really beautiful pieces um, and i ended up leaving that shop with a women's green blouse which at that time had been a, a pretty big deal for me um, gender bending was still you know pretty out of the norm for me i was still identifying and presenting male and to fathom presenting in a more effeminate form wearing women's clothing in idaho was nearly out of the question. Um, and yet something subconscious and yearned for something that would, some decision that would make me a more full-fledged version of myself, something where I could really hold on to and fully show the divine feminine that was in me my whole life. Um, so yeah, something that would allow me to be myself in full abundance. In route home, um, I am at the Minneapolis airport on a treadmill desk. They actually have a, a desk that's connected to a treadmill. So I'm on this desk, I have my laptop in front of me, I've got a few hours before my flight back to Boise and I'm just bored out of my mind, I have nothing to do. And it was really a very odd and yet beautiful opportunity to just sit there and think, sit there and spend time on my laptop doing something that was productive. I had no work to do, I went through all my emails, I was pretty bored. And then for some reason that I honestly don't recall off the top of my head at the time, I typed into Google male to female gender transitioning and it just kind of came out of me. And it was really the sense that my subconscious was working in this way and in, in, in this taking advantage of this opportunity and saying this is finally an opportunity to just sit and read and learn and digest and reflect on everything that had been bubbling up in me for at that point about a year where I was really starting to explore who I was in a very sincere and authentic way. Um, being half Japanese in Japan, queerness and trans identity is really not something that is accepted and is common. And I lived in Tokyo for six years and you just, you don't see it, you don't talk about it. And so in my head, there was just never this option. And 
back at the airport, I am getting into this rabbit hole of hormones and electrolysis, uh, voice training, surgeries, and my heart just started racing. I was so excited for the first time in my life. At that point, I was 28. I really had this epiphany of just, I want to transition. I want to hormonally, socially, spiritually transition. Um, and I want to start now and yesterday, in fact. Um, and so upon returning home, I broke the news to my partner. And soon thereafter, I met with a doctor and a therapist and began the transition process, which is so much more than one could ever expect. It's a lifelong process. People around you, the world around you has to transition as you transition. Um, and with all the exciting wonders and all of the finalities also came a myriad of struggles, um, having to break the news to my family and my friends, um, operating in a world um, where I just didn't quite know how to act, wearing makeup, um, with the hormones, growing boobs, <laughs> uncovering the mysteries of bras. Bras were always super mysterious to me. And what was actually one of the most poignant things was losing my male privilege and learning firsthand the realities of what it is to be a female presenting person, a female identifying person in this world, which is one that is heavily misogynistic. And overcoming that, those hurdles brought me joy and finding the joy also presented hurdles. And it's been a constant experience. I'm still transitioning. Life continues. Um, and nearly 20 months later, uh, here I am, um, liberated and truly happily, happy as ever. Um, you know, hindsight 2020 is a really funny thing. I know it's kind of a cliche term that people often use, but it truly is a very, very interesting phenomenon where we're able to look back on our past and think, what was it that happened and how is my brain changing it, you know, and seeing it in a much more rosy way, in a much more positive light. And even more interesting to me in this whole process of transitioning and accepting who I really am is reacquainting myself with a new version of how I am, how I live, how the world sees me. Um, it's so interesting. And looking back now at the age of 29, 27 weeks until I complete, <laughs> I've tried to slip in as many 20s as I can, 27 weeks until I complete what researcher Meg Jay calls the defining decade. Um, it's clear as day to me now, looking back, that this was always something that I wanted to do. Um, and yet, as I mentioned, the idea of trans transgender and transitioning was just never there. I knew I was always a queer person, but to me, that was simply that I was a gay male, not a transgender female or, or female identifying person. Um, the role of male was just so prevailing. The fear of backlash was so deep. Um, but really through taking conscious efforts to thoughtfully explore myself, um, giving myself time to cultivate self-love, shifting my perspective, um, to see that what I perceived to be grave weaknesses, namely my femininity and something that was targeted by bullies, something that what society was deeming was not good, all of a sudden now became my most powerful asset and something that I could emerge from and, and become a much more resolute person in now my 30s as I become a mostly fully developed adult. Um, I'm actually soon gonna begin my master's in social work and hopefully dedicate my whole career to counseling um, queer and trans people, um, people of color, people in need where trauma has really impacted them. And I am first and foremost a living artifact of that and yet also the benefactor of therapy. And I just more than anything want to ensure that people of all identities, um, of all races, of all backgrounds are able to enjoy their lives just like everyone else who may not have to suffer from those same differences. So I'm back in Wilder now. Um, I enter this woman's home, this is the first survey I'm doing, female presenting, and it ended up going super easy, super, super simple. And that was the first of what ended up being 136 surveys that I did that year in this very small rural town. and. It was honestly the most validating experience that I've had uh, since transitioning was being able to be in rural Idaho, having conversations with people where they either didn't know that I was transgender or that they didn't care. And regardless, it's been a very affirming experience knowing that ultimately, as long as you're who you are, as long as that process is something that you hold that resolution through and through, um, you know, it's gonna, it's, it's all gonna work out. Um, this year obviously is a different story. Um, we will see with the pandemic whether I'm even allowed to go back uh, during our survey period. 
but you know, alas, life goes on. All of us are continuing our lives. Um, I'm continuing my journey to feminize and to brighten the world as best I can. Um, and truly, thank goodness, I found the tenacity in my tender little sensitive heart to take the leap and to flourish in all the ways that I have since that fateful day. As I was saying, thank you, Joni, for that beautiful story. And I don't know if you can see the comments, but uh, there's a lot of love for you there uh, for sharing your amazing story. What an inspiration you are, an eloquent speaker. Enjoyed hearing your story. Rocket, sister. Thank you for sharing. That was amazing. Love you. Beautiful. Fantastic. It goes on and on. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we do have some people who have raised their hand uh, to be a slammer. There's still an opportunity for that. If you've come up with a story that fits with the 20s, um, raise your hand and we can bounce over to you in just a little bit. Uh, we have a, some people to choose from, but uh, put that hand up now and leave it up and we can get to some more slammers. But we need to, Lita, I think we need to have some birthday cake. So I'm going to try and pass yeah. you. I'm going to try and pass yeah. you a cake, okay? First Please. I have to grab it. Okay. No, just the not lit yet. Yeah. All right, so here is a piece of cake for you. And make sure you make a noise when you grab it so the camera switches. There you go. Thank oh. you for that birthday cake. <laughs> wow, okay, that, that uh, changed into something different. Okay, right? now, we're gonna, now we can light the candles. And we can enjoy our cake. I think, whoops, I lost my fork. All right, I got it now. Look, there's even another package from Junk. That includes napkins with records on them, like our theme, and also some some plates uh, for our birthday festivities. Okay, here we go. Can you play Happy Birthday for us? Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, story, story night. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. To you. Okay. Many more. Oh, I hope there are many more. Yes. All right. I'm gonna. Can you see my candles? Yes. All right. Here we go. <gasps> Yay! <laughs> Happy birthday, story, story. All right. And while we are doing that, I'm. There are going to select a slammer who right now will disappear for a moment and reappear in our panelist window. So. That's happening to someone right now. Let's make sure we can activate their video. All right. Javier, it's you. Oh, hello. <laughs> there you are. Look at that. OK. Uh, Lita will play a little song for you, and then we'll come back to your video, and you can share your story. Five minutes. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. Take it away, Lita. a great intro song um so do i just start or is there any rules uh, i need to be aware of uh you just start it's five minutes on the theme keep it family friendly and if we go too long i will chime in okay perfect um my story is uh i'd like to chat about the topic of resiliency um i was really inspired by the last couple stories and um it seems like the world is in a really strange spot right now and some days it almost seems like 
I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do to get through it because it's a, a really weird time, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people in the audience and, and in this session probably feel the same that, you know, the world is in a scary place right now. We're worried about our relatives, we're worried about our family. We might be going through trauma of our own aside from um, this pandemic. So I'd just like to share a quick story about my time in the military. Um, I spent four years in the Marine Corps. Um, as soon as I graduated high school, I actually, first thing I did was I signed the papers and I decided to head out to the military. I have a grandfather who was in the Marine Corps and um, him and a couple other family members who also served in the military kind of kind of encouraged me to join and I was really inspired by them. And so I wanted to, to follow in their footsteps. Um, and I knew that it would be hard. I knew that um, the military is, you know, it's not the easiest job to, to apply for, if you will. But I, I wasn't expecting kind of the mental difficulty that I would have to, to put up with. I was physically as prepared as I could be. I worked out as much as I could to get ready for boot camp. Um, but I had quite, not quite prepared myself for, for the mental challenge of it all. Um, and for my first couple of years in the military, I was, um, you know, honestly very depressed and I was going through a very difficult time. Um, you know, being far away from your family and all that is, is tough enough, but there were, you know, definitely some mental health issues that started to present themselves as, as I was a young person and as I entered the military and the, um, the, the mind games that sometimes get played in the military um, really ate at me. And um, I think, you know, kind of deepened my depression. And there were some really toxic um, ideas that I was surrounded by, mainly one of them being that, um, you know, as a Marine, you're supposed to be tough and you're supposed to be able to take everything that's thrown at you. And, you know, I was, I was trained, I had a job to do. Um, I, I worked in helicopters for four years fixing them. And it wasn't an easy job, but um, it was a job and I loved it and I learned a lot of cool things. But even though I could keep up with all the physical challenges, for some reason I couldn't keep up with the challenge in my own head. Um, and it was really difficult. Um, but the, the mindset that I was surrounded by was this mindset that, you know, you, you suck it up and you, you kind of um, embrace the challenge. You embrace the pain and you move on and you deal with it another time. And in a lot of ways, that makes sense in a military environment, you know, because you don't always have the time to deal with um, to deal with the things in your own head at that time. You have to keep moving forward and you have to keep pressing forward, get the job done and worry about everything else later. But I would find myself, you know, in my barracks room late at night, you know, surrounded by these awful thoughts. And I won't go into detail. Anybody who has suffered from depression or, you know, suicidal ideation or things like that knows exactly what that feels like. Um, but I, I still had this mindset that I couldn't seek help. You know, I kind of had to tough it out and figure it out on my own. Um, that was the first two years of my military experience. And then in the latter two was when I finally started discovering that you don't have to do it all on your own. Even if you, you know, are a Marine and you're trained to, to kind of handle the things that are thrown at you, you don't have to go through the mental struggle alone. And at that point, I had started developing some, some sleeping issues. Um, I won't go into detail there. Um, but they became um, really severe to the point that I, I realized I couldn't handle it on my own anymore. Um, and it took a lot of effort to, you know, to, to ask my unit for permission to go to the doctor because I had up until that time been taught that, you know, you keep it to yourself unless, you know, you break a limb or something serious, you don't really need to go to the doctor. Um, but I sought out help. And ever since then, I've been on this journey of, of recovery and understanding that, even if the world is falling apart, at least inside your own head, it, you know, it might be falling apart out there as well. But even if the world seems like it's falling apart, you don't have to go through it alone. Even, you know, when you're in isolation, like a lot of us find ourselves right now, I still am on that journey and I still am trying to figure it out. Um, but I would say that when I finally figured out that you don't have to tough it out, even if you're a Marine, and there are resources out there that you can make it through it. So I just wanna encourage everybody out there who might be feeling um, similar things, might be going through a similar situation, or if you just feel like you're at the end of, the, of your rope, realize you don't have to go through it alone and there are resources out there. So um, that's my story and uh, hope it helps somebody out there. Thank you so much, Javier. And uh gonna have a bite of cake hmm. that's our show everybody that's our 10th birthday show i have some 
Thank you, Sudu. And Lita's going to play us a song after this, too. Of course, I have cake in my mouth now. Thank you for the support from the Boise Arts and History Department. This program is supported in part by the Idaho Commission on the Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you to our media sponsors, Boise State Public Radio and Radio Boise. We also have a radio show. It's Story, Story Night on Stray Theater, which you can hear the Sunday before our live show from 5.30 to 6 on Radio Boise. And of course, you can always listen to our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or however you listen to podcasts. Uh, the link is on our website, storystorynight.org. Thank you to our crew, our musical guest, Lita Harris Newstetter, Carolyn Valaket monitoring the chat, and our photographer, Chelsea Harada, capturing screenshots for our archive and for social media. I can see some clapping on the screen there. That's fun. Look for her photos and tag yourself on our Facebook page in just a few days. Thank you to our first ever comedy writer, Brianna Koch. I think I said that right. Thank you to all our volunteer board of directors, our storytellers, Zoo Boise. Uh, you can help them again on Idaho Gives. Thank you to Jump for all the presents. And thank you to those of you who added a financial gift on top of your Webinite registration. Together, you brought in an extra $400 to support Story Story Night. Our next show is scheduled is Story Story Late Night, end of June. Keep looking on our Facebook page, etc., for updates. Oh, and of course, last time this season, Story Story Night. Story Story Good Night. Beginning, middle, now, at the end. Authentic, inspiring, spontaneous. So thank you, you shared your story and you really listened. I might have come here as a stranger. But now I'm leaving as a friend. And so the story doesn't end. Happy 10 years, everybody. Thanks for being here with us. I see you clapping. I see your comments. We appreciate you so much for going with us on this journey. And now I'm going to turn you over to Lita Harris Newstetter, who will close out the show. Good night, everybody. These are tough times, but guess what? First, I was afraid. I was petrified. Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. But I spent all so many nights. Thinking how I did me wrong, I grew strong. I learned how to get along and on your back from our space. Just walked in to find you here with that little on your face. I should have changed that stupid lock. I should have made you leave the key. I'd have known for just one second. You see, back to body me, I'll never go. Walk out the door. Just turn around now. You're not welcome anymore. Weren't you the one who tried to hurt me with the bite? You think I'd run more? You think I'd lay down and die on the night? I will survive. Oh, as long as I know how to love, I know I'll be alive. I got all my left me. I got all my left you, and I will survive. I will survive. Oh, straight back at my Trying not to miss them from my broken heart. I spent oh so many nights feeling sorry for myself. I used to cry, but now I hold my head up high. Just let me somebody new. I'm not that tender little girl who's still in love with you. Two different men dropping in, just expect me to be free. And now I'm saving all my loving for someone who's loving me. I'll never walk out the Just turn around now, you're not welcome anymore. Weren't you the one who tried to hurt me with the bye? Think I crumble? You think I lay down and die? Oh my God, I, I will survive. Oh, as long as I know how to love, I know I'll be alive. 